Thanks, Chad. Um, let me reinforce uh, the appreciation for your time and effort um, to come here and visit us today. I'm going to talk about Pure One um, for about 20 minutes, and I have a couple setup slides, and then I'm actually going to do a live demo and would absolutely uh, love questions and comments as I go through. Um, so Pure One is a cloud-based management and support offering. So I'm going to talk about both Pure One support, which is a bunch of software that we write and enable that really enables our support team to give customers a great user experience. So it's not something as a user of the Pure Storage Array you really see it, but it's important to the experience of owning the array. And I'm going to um, focus specifically on software upgrades and some innovative technology that we've really built on top of the non-disruptive upgrade capability that Chad already referenced. Um, the second piece of it, I want to talk about Pure One Manage, which is the user SaaS portal for you know, visibility of all your flash arrays in one screen. Um, I'm going to start with a, a you know, quick kind of architecture picture just so you get a sense of how the data flow in the system works. So when I bring up, the next thing I'm going to do is bring up the GUI itself of Pure One Manage. I want you to understand kind of what's being shown in the screen and how the data got there. Um, and then I want to introduce you to kind of the capabilities that we've added to that. And it's a SaaS portal, so it's uh, you know a, a great ability to basically add capabilities to the system over time. And I actually have a, a very late-breaking addition that we've just done to the site. We actually uh, pushed it to the site very recently, a new capability of the site. You'll be some of the, the first folks to really see it, but it is a, a publicly available offering to all of our customers. Um, so with that, let me, let me jump into Pure One support. So Pure One support, as I mentioned, is technology that we use to enable our support team to give customers this great experience. Mm. And if you can see the, the, the subtitle there, uh, I want to talk about upgrades for a minute and how the simplicity of upgrades should be dramatically reduced. And, and really, you know, the analogy I'm going to use is, you know, because it's one that's very familiar to a lot of folks, is the simplicity of upgrading your mobile device, right, your phone or your, your tablet. How come that simplicity can't be brought into the data center? Like, what are the challenges and obstacles and what are the benefits of that? Um, most of you are familiar with it because you, you upgrade you know, your software on a regular basis. I have no doubt that many of you upgraded, you know, Apple's recently upgraded a new piece of software. Many of you have probably actually gone and updated the software already. Um, it's fast to get new features and it's fast to get um, essentially defect fixes delivered through that model. So your, your device is kind of always fresh. It's a, a form of being evergreen, I would say. And there's, there's a, a bunch of challenges when you really start to look into data centers as to why hasn't that, that same user experience been brought from that consumer world over to a data center. Um, and I'm going to talk about these kind of two columns here. The first one is you have to figure out who to upgrade and who to upgrade in what order. You know, we have uh, thousands of flash arrays that are hooked up to our Pure One system that are phoning home information. And the first part of it is to find the needle in the haystack. And what I mean by that is it would be easy to assume that, hey, everybody should just get the latest software and we should wave a magic wand and say, we come out with a piece of new software today and tomorrow these thousands of arrays are magically updated. Now, of course, you appreciate in a data center, it's not that simple. Um, customers have their own set of um, you know, operational <laughs> windows, handshakes they have to do with app teams, other things like that before they go through upgrades. Historically, you know, we've talked to a lot of customers, they might want to upgrade once a year, right? You know, they have uh, you know, certain behavior patterns that have been, really been in, in, instantiated in their operational process, and we really want to change that. And the first thing we want to do is deliver this proactive support experience. And the way we do that is we basically look at the incoming call home data we have and we auto-generate support tickets for ourselves. So we, we don't rely on the customer to monitor the system and if it breaks to call us and say, hey, I think the system broke, can you come help me take a look at it? We auto-generate support tickets and historically, 70% of all the support tickets we have in Pure Storage have been automatically generated. Um, and that's a great, you know, proactive experience because we're essentially monitoring the system for our customers. And we yearn to continue to kind of push that and, and do more. And of course, as our business grows and the number of arrays we have scales, it's very important for us to focus our support team on the most important of those alerts. 
right? Which, which ones of the thousands of alerts we may have are the really critical kind of SEV1 issues versus which ones are, we get an alert when arrays start to fill up. If you get the array to 80% full, we generate an alert for ourselves and say, hey, your array is 80% full. We might call you and say, you know, you, is your workload gonna continue to grow? Would you be interested in getting more capacity? You have to think about this because you know we can see your system's at 80% full. That's not a SEV1 issue. We want to focus on SEV1s first. And part of our goal has been, and you can kind of see this uh, chart down here on the bottom right, which is the number of tickets we generate per array per week. So it's a normalized chart. And along the bottom, you probably can't see the numbers, are weeks of the year. So this was a, a chart that I took. It's a backward looking chart. Uh, that was snapped in July. And basically you can see the, the line is down into the right, which means we, we've spent a bunch of time essentially correlating and in some senses kind of deduplicating the alert stream we have for ourselves. Um, a simple example of, of this might be if you were to unplug a SAS cable from the flash array, you know, there's additional expansion shelves on the system and you unplug a SAS cable, the controller will lose access to the shelf. It also loses access to all the drives in all the slots. We have an alert that pops up if you pull an individual drive out, there's an alert that pops up that says, hey, that drive is no longer accessible to the controller. But if you unplug the entire shelf, you don't wanna generate 24 alerts, right? There's actually one root cause that you're more concerned about. So we spend a bunch of time looking at our alerts and figuring out how we apply software in line in this essentially set of data that's coming back to us to, to generate the alerts that are most useful to look into. Um, because again, we have uh, an, an incredible support team. It needs to grow and, and keep up with our customer base as we get lots and lots of arrays out in the field. And we're gonna continue to invest in building good intelligence and analytics into our system to focus ourselves on the alerts that matter the most. And obviously we know a lot about the internals of our system, so we, we can continue to do that. The second thing that we do is we've built something that we refer to as a fingerprint engine. and. It's interesting, so fingerprints are essentially um, classifications where we know we've discovered you know, some defect in our system and we've um, programmatically captured that and we can process the incoming log stream that we get back from the arrays to see if you're susceptible to a certain fingerprint. And the reason we want to do that is that a lot of the defects we have in our system are very um, nuanced. They're very obscure. You, you really have to do, let's, let's say, 10 steps in a, in a process to hit a defect. If you're eight steps of the way through this 10-step process, we want to find and update your software before you ever hit the defect. Um, because we never want to have the experience, um, what, what I'll call is the traditional way defects are found in the data center. And, and we've heard a lot of customers and gotten a lot of people to shake their heads, which is, have you ever had an experience where the, the system at hand, whether it be storage, network, you know, server, whatnot, in the data center, didn't do well. As a user, you monitored it, you found an issue, you called the support organization for the given vendor, and they said, oh, we know about that issue, you just need to upgrade the software and it'll go away. To us, you know, we consider that to be a completely backward process that you as a user, one, you shouldn't have to do that work yourself, and two, as a vendor, if you know there's defects in your system, you should really be proactive about getting customers who are susceptible to those uh, defects onto the fixed version of software before they ever hit it. It shouldn't be a reactive process, it should be proactive. And the fingerprinting system essentially is what allows us to look in our install base and find people who are susceptible to hitting defects before they actually happen. And it's a great concept. It sounds a little bit, you know, like trying to foretell the future, but let me give you a couple examples to kind of drive them home. The first one is um, we found a, an, an issue around uh, large scale sand boot environments. Not every customer does sand boot, right? A lot of customers boot off their local drives. It's a very nuanced issue that only happens when you sand boot systems. There's a race condition. We have a fix for it. So we want to basically look out in our installed base to find people who are using sand boot and prioritize them to get the fix before other customers who are less susceptible to hit the problem. Another example is um, there's a very nuanced issue that we found a while ago. Um, that caused an out of memory issue and would cause uh, uh, a controller failover. 
If you have your multi-pathing set up in the system, it's actually transparent to the application. But needless to say, you want to reduce controller failovers in any environment. You know, our system is really designed to um, you know, really mitigate these systems. But on a certain workload I.O. pattern, there was a, a, a queue essentially in our system, a software queue that could fill up and get out of memory, and we have a fix for it. And again, we can actually look at the log stream that comes into our system, find people who have right patterns that may expose the issue. We can look at the size of the queue and essentially prioritize fixes to get people upgraded. Um, and the last one was, a, a, again, a, a fairly specific set of conditions, which was you had to be using 16-gig 16, 16 fiber channel. You had to have a 16-gig fiber channel SAN. You had to be using a hypervisor, in this case ESX specifically. Um, and you had to have a high I.O. load. Again, it's a certain subset of our customer bases. Um, this was early on when 16-gig really first came out. There was actually a, a small defect in one of the firmware modules that is a component of our system. As you can imagine, we have... Uh, you know, um, hey Brian, can you actually deliver a specific fix to a specific customer, or are you you just you know packaging them up in a release level and saying you need to put on this release? Or um, we do um, operate at the release level. We don't do too many hot fixes. Um, part of the the, the right hand side of this is that so so the first thing is you need to find customers who need upgrades, right. and you want to find the the important customers you know, to, to go after. The second piece is how do you, as seamlessly as possible, deliver the fix to people? Whether it's a, it's a hot fix or a larger set of software, just for simplicity, we're, we're very uh, strong on simplicity. Um, we have a very simple kind of numbering model, x.y.z for our version numbers, kind of everything goes through that. There's not some extra kind of giblets at the end and patch numbers and things like that. It'll always come as a, as a purity release. Now the size of the release and what it fixes can vary uh, quite a bit but it'll always come, come through a, a, a purity upgrade. And, and how often do you generate releases? Um, is that it, on a periodic basis? Or it, 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 uh, we have an agile development model, so it happens quite a bit. Not every one of them we actually release externally, though, to customers. Um, like every month or every uh, It's generally more frequent than that. We've obviously been around for a couple years here. We have a couple major release branches in the, in the market at this point. Um, one of our goals is to get customers upgraded to newer versions of software. And the value of that is new features get exposed to them, right? We have an all software inclusive pricing model. We had customers who bought our product when, before we had replication built into the product, they got a software upgrade that gave them replication for free. So we want to kind of move customers forward, both for feature velocity and kind of innovation. They can do more things with it, but also to make them less susceptible to defects that we've found and fixed already. Um, so how long does it typically take to get like 50% penetration with a release? Um, it's a great question about how long does it take to get 50% penetration. I don't know the exact number of kind of days or weeks to do that, but l let me give you, I did run a report recently that if you, if you looked at our entire installed base of arrays that are hooked up to our Pure One system, right, it's thousands of arrays, we've been pretty public about that, that 91% of those arrays are running software that we have produced in the last eight months. We have another public blog post that said last year in 2014, we shipped more than a thousand arrays to more than 25 countries around the world. Right? Scott Dietzen had a nice kind of summary of the year for pure storage. So you can assume those thousand arrays that we shipped last year, 91% of them have already gotten better software. So this is a, um, I would say, a big bet for us to continue to invest in this technology because we can find issues. And then over here on the right side, we're doing things to reduce any possible friction to getting um, fixes into the, the user's environment. The, the absolute foundation for this is non-disruptive upgrades. The fact that we can upgrade the array while it's up and running and giving you performance such that the app doesn't see it is a foundational element. If you didn't have that, a lot of this work on the left would be less than interesting because there'd be a lot of friction on scheduling downtime and going through all the possible coordinations to deal with a brownout event or, God forbid, an actual hard downtime event for the array. So we have this foundational capability on NDU that we're really leveraging and building on top of. There's other things we've done to really simplify this uh, kind of flow of software into our user environment, which is um, one of the processes, if you think about how um, firmware updates are done or software updates are done, there's often a pre-flight check. We have one ourselves that we would run. The, the support engineers would get on your system, they would run a pre-flight check 
is this system healthy enough to do the update now? I wanna make sure that all the host hosts you have connected to me have multipathing properly set up, such that if I were to reboot one controller, the other controller's up and running, the multipathing kicks in, IO continues to flow, etc. We do a number of these pre-flight checks, and if they don't pass, we would alert the customer and say, hey, we, we don't think we should go forward with this upgrade. Go, please, you know, look at the host multipathing software and resolve the issue, or tell us it's a test and dev box, and frankly, you don't really care if it has a small bit of downtime. So there would be these pre-flight checks that we would run, and we would essentially do them on the array at the time we're attempting to do the install. And what we've done is we've essentially moved those pre-flight checks into the cloud. So the, the checks that we're doing, we essentially have that information flowing back to us on a regular basis, and we can pull that pre-flight check forward and frankly run it all the time. Again, to try to find and, and um, you know, resolve issues before we get to the point when we actually need to do the upgrade. It's like the kind of regular hygiene on your system that you don't ever want to kind of get into this, this situation where you want to do the upgrade, but now I have to go to the host, the, the server admin team, etc. If we pull that forward, it allows those things to be done asynchronously ahead of time. Another thing we've done, again, because we have a, a great support team, we want to reduce the number of manual steps that they have to do to do the upgrade. Um, I'm, a, I'm of, the, of the belief that any manual process at scale is error prone. It, you know, we have a large support team, a huge customer base. If we have a hard manual process about how you look through the release notes and figure out um, you know, what, what the kind of next target is to upgrade to purity, in, in a lot of cases, it'll be done great, but you know, maybe there'll be a new support engineer, someone you know, who, makes a, who makes a poor decision, et cetera. We wanna minimize that. We essentially automatically create the software bundle um, that essentially is the, the delivery vehicle for the fix. Regardless of it's a small hot fix, a small patch, a firmware update that maybe goes on one of the underlying modules in the system, all those can be essentially created into a bundle automatically and essentially deliver to the, the tech support team without them having to kind of read through release notes and deal with the complexities and, and kind of manual process of that. And we essentially download that onto the array and actually do the upgrade. And we're in the process of basically getting to the point where we're gonna be able to stage these on the array. And I would argue that the, the best scenario over the long term is the one that you have with your mobile devices. No one logs into your mobile device to do an upgrade, right? It's kind of ludicrous to actually think about it. But unfortunately, that's what's done in the data center. Like people actually get onto devices and manually execute upgrades that we want to apply high degrees of automation such that we can do it at scale reliably without human error. You got to find them and then you have to kind of without friction be able to kind of deliver these upgrades. So it's a it's a big focus area for us. And unfortunately, because the lighting, you probably can't see the chart down there on the bottom right. Um, we're doing a pretty good job already. And frankly, you know, are pretty bullish about investment in this area. You know, it's a picture that showed in July of this year, we did, you know, north of 500 array upgrades in the month. Um, so it's an area where, as a user, you don't really see the back-end technology we're building, but it's important to us, and we're going to apply, kind of I'll say, you know, some of the folks who sit out here, high-end software engineering talent to basically help us find issues and fingerprint them and basically help us figure out what the best cadence and when to do upgrades for people, and then also invest in great software to basically deliver these fixes to people so they're always running you know, new, current, great software, less defects in it, um, and they have ac access to great features. Does, does the concept make sense? And I'm curious if there's any kind of questions, thoughts, comments. Can a customer block software upgrades? Can they prevent you from installing a new software? A absolutely. We never update mm -hmm. software without the customer's permission, period. And that was, that's always true, right? It's, it would be, uh, it'd be ludicrous to do anything else. Uh so, uh, is everything that you described now uh, inclusive in the basic packaging of uh, storage? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, my second topic, which is Pure One Manage, which is the user facing side of this. So, 
I have a picture here just to show you the data flow. I'm going to bring up the GUI next. Um, Larry's going to come over and, and hook in my laptop, so we'll do a live demo. But first, I want to basically show you what the data flow is. Um, down here at the bottom, I have a picture of a couple flash arrays. And the flash arrays essentially are set up to our phone home system. And in our system, um, there's small bits of information. I'll call it a little pulse of data that's actually sent back every 30 seconds from the array. There's some larger sets of logs and other things we do at different frequencies. But essentially, think about these systems as almost real-time connected to our, our cloud environment. It's not real-time. It's every 30 seconds. But it's, it's very up-to-date information. It's very fresh. And we essentially built a system similar to what I was talking about in the past that basically stores and can process the stream of information. We use it for our support team to do all the things I just talked about, to fingerprint issues and to basically help figure out how to triage and troubleshoot. So the system was originally built to enable our support organization. And frankly, our engineering team uses it quite a bit as well because we can instrument our software really well and see, is the software behaving as we designed it to? Is it is it expected? So assume we have a fairly large data set. It's actually petabytes and petabytes of data at this point. And we've internally, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this, we've built a whole set of analytics and other things that we use this data for to deliver this great experience. And frankly, have a closed loop engineering process. We can take feedback and kind of refine the design of the array over time, the software architecture of the array. We have this large data set, and it's near real time. Um, so a while ago, we basically embarked on a process to basically carve off a small piece of that data and show it back to users themselves. So what we do is we process it, we put it in, a, in another cache database, and we essentially have built an application on top of that cache database that allows users to log in and see the health and status of their arrays. It's actually, um, it uses, there was a question earlier about authentication. It uses the single sign-on environment we have for our, I would say, our customer web properties. Um, so they, previous to us, we, we released this on June 1st of this year. Uh, previous to this, we had a community site where people could log in and look at knowledge base articles and collaborate with other peer storage users, etc. cetera. Um, and we also had a support site where they could log in and see status of their support tickets, etc. cetera. Um, we essentially have leveraged the same username password as a single sign on an environment where you want to have, we want to have our customers have one seamless user experience when they basically attach to this system. Um, and over time, we've been working on doing mashups of these sites. So today, even when you see the demo across the top, you'll actually see that you can cross launch between these three sites. It's not that you have some separate login for support over here and then a separate one for their community there and some other thing for you know a, uh, another, another application they have. You know, people have too many passwords today, usernames, et cetera. So it's something that we really wanted to stay away from. So we have a system that allows us to log in and see data that the array is sending back to us. Does the data flow make sense? Um, yeah. do, do you have the ability to then use like role-based access control to limit that down to only being able to see that data? And then potentially customers could use that for their ops teams as like a warboard? Um, or similarly, maybe yes. an API that they could pull that data down and then display it however they want at their end? So today, and you'll see the demo, and, and maybe Larry, you should come over and uh, get my laptop plugged in so we can, we can uh, get going with the demo, <coughs> is um, it, the first thing we went after, uh, I think you called it the warboard, our, our term was the, the, the knock operator, is we want to get a system, and actually if you walk around pure storage, we actually use this internally. You'll actually see it on some of our, our boards and stuff like that. The first piece of software that we delivered on June 1st was um, our compact card. It was a way for you to basically see a bunch of arrays all on one screen, and it was absolutely intended for an operator slash knock type use case. And we absolutely have customers who we know use it, use it for this. And over time, we've essentially, since June 1st, been adding capabilities to the site to basically um, add more value, basically deliver more value to users based on this data set that, that we have. Um, it is obviously um, constrained from a visibility standpoint that you only get to see your arrays, you can't see anybody else's arrays, obviously, you know, a bunch of the things you would obviously expect. Um, so there are some capabilities that, that essentially deliver that. Um, and, you know, when we released this on June 1st, one of the great things about it is because it's a SaaS application, the ability to deliver the value that we've created to end users is dramatically reduced. So historically, if you think about how people have solved this problem, 
you would have a bunch of devices, you would build a centralized management server, and then you would ask the customer to go install it. I give you the application, it's your job to set it up and manage it. You have to get a server or space on a hypervisor. You need to get underlying storage assigned to it. You need to get network connectivity between that management server and the underlying devices set up. You need to put in IP addresses, yada, 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 yada. Yeah, you've probably been down this path before. Setting up and managing servers for IT, it's just like any other application. And unfortunately, it's an application that only IT uses. So all the lines of business that IT is supporting like don't care about it at all. It's just, it's, I would argue it's a tax that, IP, that the IT team pays to manage the environment. And a SaaS product, essentially a SaaS experience, completely removes that. Literally, username, password on the site, you can log in and see the health and status of your arrays. Um, so we've had great traction. We've had the ability to get a lot of customers onto the site since June 1st. The other great value of a SaaS platform is our ability to deliver new capabilities to it. So I'm, I'm going to show you two extra capabilities that are present on the site that are present now that were not present on June 1st. Right? So you know, it's only been a couple months. We've added two important capabilities, and customers have had to do zero upgrades. Right? When we build a new feature and capability, every customer who has it just logs back into the site, and there it is. Right? So the, again, the delivery of value is way different than if, I, than if we were to build a feature and ask you to go update that piece you just installed last month, you'd be like, come back in three months, I just did it, I, I don't have time to do it again, I got 50 other things to do on my plate. So the delivery of new features is an, is an important capability as well as just the simplicity of the user experience itself. So what you can see here on the first screen is what we first released on June 1st. It's a set of what I'll call cards, and each card is one flash array. This is a demo environment that our system engineers use um, to basically do demos for customers, etc. And I essentially have the Pure One managed instance running on top of those flash arrays. So you can see a bunch of the names, SE East, SE West, etc. So there's a bunch of pure storage arrays that we have just for the illustration purposes of the demo. Um, and every card essentially gives you the quick summary of the array make and model, what version of purity it's using, what is the capacity of the array, what data reduction am I getting, what is the basic performance stats of the array that I get, basically get updated every 30 seconds. You'll see a little orange gear there pop up. The site is essentially refreshing itself on a regular basis. So it's essentially real-time information for your NOC team. And you can see one card here. There's actually a little yellow block up in the top right that indicates that there's an open alert on this array. And if you actually click on it, you can flip over the card and see what the alert is. So we're essentially getting back the alert information from the array. We can visualize it here. Um, the other capabilities of the site are pretty interesting. So another thing that we did early on, June 1st, we actually set up replication so you can see replication jobs on the array between two arrays. It's again, it's a great multi-array use case. I can see snapshots here that have been replicated from the source to the target, and you get a little bit of information about the replication job. How long did it take? How much data was transferred? We have a great replication capability just natively built into the array that's you know, dedupe aware, et cetera. But you can get good health and statuses. Is my data being protected? Because as a storage admin, that's like an important thing for you to, you to keep track of. So do you have access to this data outside of the interface? Can I use an API to pull the data myself? Um, not today. We do not uh, publish the API. I will tell you that um, you know, our, our array itself, um, the Flash Array, a lot of people are familiar with the GUI. They've seen it. I think it's been demoed in past storage field days. Um, the array itself has an incredibly strong REST API. Um, all the information you see here is actually available in the product itself. Obviously, we're not kind of synthetically creating any information. So for a lot of users, the easiest way to do automation against the array, whether it be for monitoring or other things, is to actually <coughs> use the direct API of the array itself. And we've really tried to enable that by, one, making our array world class. It's always updated. It's fully documented. We've built PowerShell and Python scripting toolkits on top of it. So if you don't have a lot of REST tooling in your environment and you're more of a scripter, there's a lot of <coughs> easy ways you can consume it. Uh, we fully appreciate the value of APIs, um, but there is not a publicly exposed one on Pure One today. Um, it is available. Sorry, I have a question. So yes. 
The array is uh, API ready from all point of views. You have a repository of these uh, APIs uh, like, uh, I don't know, source code uh, that you share with the customers? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm a big programmatic infrastructure guy uh, by, by nature. Um, I've done a lot of work in that space in the past. One, every array, if you find a pure storage array and look on the help menu on the top right and click on it, you'll find the user guide and the REST API guide. It is fully documented. Um, we actually auto-generate the code samples that are in that document. So we know there's no bugs in the document itself. If we show you sample output of the array, you know, kind of you do a REST call and basically get back a bunch of information, we auto-generate the examples that are in there so we know they're accurate. We've also done something to really um, address the issue of um, API compatibility over time. So, so let's just say, for an example, you want to integrate with, with our system. You build some either REST calls or Python or PowerShell or whatnot to integrate with the API. And then, by the way, you go and do an update to purity. And there's new features. There's a new version of the API available. How do you know your script doesn't break or your integration doesn't break? It, you know, it's been one of these um, subtle but complex problems in a data center to make sure that dependencies between systems are kind of maintained over time. So what we've decided to do, and this is true in the array today, you can actually go see it, is that new versions of the API come out in new versions of Purity. Currently it's uh, 1.4 is the current version. The current version of Purity also supports the 1.3, the 1.2, the 1.1, and the 1.0 API. So one version of Purity today actually supports five versions of the REST API. So when you write your code to integrate with our system, you essentially codify in the REST statements what version of the API you've codified to, and future upgrades of Purity will preserve that behavior. If you want to take advantage of new features, you'll obviously have to upgrade your code, but it's a way for us to deliver backward compatibility for some of the more, I'd say, um, you know, aggressive customers who do do interesting things with the APIs today. We have folks who do infrastructure analytics use cases, sucking information out of the array, etc. We want to uh, keep those things going. Yeah, but probably I was not clear. So I, I want to know if you have a community. So and Absolutely. users uh, sharing code. Uh, yes. So my, my apologies. I think I misunderstood your question then. So we do have a community site, as I showed on the earlier Pure One slide. The Pure One community today does have a lot of examples. Some of them are provided by us, our technical marketing team, writes scripts, contributes them. We have some of the folks in our field team, our SEs. We absolutely have customers who contribute as well. We actually had a customer at, a, we had a recent advisory board. One of the customers came to the advisory board and as part of the agenda, we actually had them demo a PowerShell based, or I'm sorry, a Python based integration they had done and they shared it with the other users. That happened to be a face-to-face -face meeting because we had a longer discussion. Um, but a lot of those things are absolutely available on the community today. Um, there's also a whole bunch of information that we've posted on GitHub, open source information, um, examples, the Python toolkit. You can see inside how the Python is actually mapped to the REST API. So we really want to enable these types of use cases and we've really bootstrapped that, but we've gotten to the point now where partners and customers and other folks can add value to that community as well. And it's a bit of a virtual circle, kind of everybody in that community kind of benefits from kind of contributions back to it. I think maybe as, it's, uh, as you're also centralizing and analyzing that data and then producing your, your content in one place, that would also be for futures, would be really useful as a feature. Um, I, yes. Kind of I agree. It's a, it's a good piece of feedback. And your laptop. Uh, I think my screen went off here. So um, let me, um, the when the thing pops back here, let me quickly show the other pieces of the site. As soon as the uh, projector um, re-enables it. So I want to show you, the last thing I want to show you here for the demo is essentially two features that have been added since June 1st. Um, the first one is we added a more detailed card. Um, so that uh, top level card is great. Uh, you can fit a lot of arrays on one screen. If you're gonna have a knock board or something like that, it's quite effective. But here, it's a bit of drill down information. So if you look at, I'm gonna pick on this card here in the middle. Again, each array is a card, but it's a much bigger card. You can't fit as many on the screen, but you can really see a lot more detailed information about the array. The first thing, the capacity view, doesn't just show you how full the array is. It shows you what is actually consuming the storage. So when we do our space reporting, we basically break down 
volume space, which is space that's attributed to a volume and it's unique data. It has not been deduped. So there's nobody else who has that space. You have shared space, which is where we find dedupe matches. Essentially you have more than, you have two or more volumes that are sharing blocks in the system. And then you have how much is allocated to snapshot space. Cause obviously we have space sufficient snapshots, which is, you know, essentially another way to look at how much data are you spending to protect your data and have kind of backup copies or copies you want to use for other purposes. So you can do the drill down. Each of the panes on the card also gives you the ability um, to kind of drill down even one level further. So here it's a 13 month history of the array. And I apologize, you can't see the colors too well, but the colors match here. So you can see over time, what has been the trend in my, in my data usage of the array. Is that, is that snapshot space? Is that dedicated space to hold future snapshots or that's the current space that's consumed it, by snapshot unique the, data? It's the latter, the latter. There's no um, pre-provisioning, pooling, allocation process that happens for a snapshot for us. You, you take a snapshot and this is just a representation of data blocks that are only in a snapshot, right? The volume may have overwritten it, right? Done something else with it, it no longer needs it. It's, it's just allocated to snapshots currently used. Um, they, just quickly to, to talk about the other panes, we have a health view. Um, you can quickly see on this system, we actually have some FA400s. There's actually an FA300 here as well, the first generation, and some flash AMs. So it's, um, you know, kind of spans the versions of hardware, the versions of software we produce. And you can drill into the hardware and look at individual shelves and controllers. If I wanted to look at an individual controller, I can click on the controller and I can go over here to like the fiber channel port. I'll get a little pop-up that shows me the worldwide name on the port, right? Again, if you need to talk to the SAN admin or something else, these identifiers are important for a whole bunch of correlation use cases. We've tried to make some of this information easily accessible. It would obviously also, all these green lights, um, if you ever had a hardware failure, you would see one of them turn red, etc. The last piece is the performance piece. It essentially shows you a six hour history of the performance of the array. So not just the current um, 30 second, you have a kind of a look back. So again, you can see some trends over time. This was added to the site um, in August, I believe. And of course, all of our customers who log in get access to it today. Um, the piece I uh, wanted to show you, which is the, the most recent um, feature we've added, and we're obviously quite excited about it because we've been uh, working on it for quite some time, is we recently added a new tab to the site around analytics. And today, this uh, view essentially is really intended for capacity planning. So um, we got a lot of requests for reporting, right? Storage resource management, SRM type use cases. Um, and we always yearn to kind of go the next step, take one extra step, which is if you ask us for capacity reports, it's generally a showback use case or a future like planning use case. How do I know if my array is gonna fill up? And when is it gonna fill up? And when should I kind of conceptually think about expanding capacity, you know, moving volumes between arrays, et cetera. So we've essentially built a view that is specifically focused on that. Um, it, again, each card in this system is essentially a view into an array. And there's a little dotted line right in the middle here of the, of the timeline, which is the now timeline. So things to the left of the dotted line are historical and things to the right of the dotted line are a projection or peek into the future. And of course, along the, the y-axis is capacity, zero to 100% full. And what you can do is essentially, there's two little sliders here that you can use to basically say, what time period is representative of my business? Like the app is up and running, there's processes on it. Many times when you get an array, there's some time at the beginning when you're actually loading the data, getting the app instantiated. You might wanna kind of call that out of your projection. So you're basically gonna set up a window here and get a projection into the future of how long is it gonna take and how much data do you need to add to the system to get to 90% full or 100% full. And for each array, you can basically go through and set your window and get a sense of, you know, when is the array gonna to get to a point when I need to consider, you know, taking some action. So again, a feature we just added to the site, um, you know, we're excited about this kind of SaaS model to be able to deliver new, new features to people. So about how long does it take to do a, uh non-disruptive code load 
Um, it's a great question, like how many minutes does it take? Yeah, something like that. So, um, I mean, you're talking on a per controller basis, right? It is. You know, there is obviously we have a, a non-disruptive process that you can generally think of as a rolling upgrade process yeah. in, inside the system. It's generally thought of as the controllers because that's where the brain of the system lives in purity. Um, through our releases, though, we can actually update uh, firmware in the system as well, right? So firmware onto the motherboard of the controllers, firmware onto the devices that actually are the storage, the NVRAM, the SSDs, IO modules. So it, it varies a little bit based on what the, the payload of the, of the new software is. Um, but it's generally, you know, think about it in terms of kind of minutes as the actual time to, take to do the upgrade. And we're trying to obviously keep that as small as possible by reducing the steps, the manual steps to be done, the check steps, the pre-flight checks, et cetera. Has the data format on the back end changed at all over time? Uh, great question. Um, we don't publish the data formats publicly, but they do change over time, and they always happen non-disruptively. Right? So it's a good, good design of a storage system should be able to do that. And the data is protected through rep, uh, through mirrored, uh, mirroring, or is it RAID protected? Um, we have a technology called RAID 3D, which essentially um, does create uh, parity blocks and other things, so we can survive double drive failures um, inside the system. So it is a somewhat proprietary flash-centric design of how we've designed that, but there are duplicate copies of data. And we have a little bit more information on RAID 3D from previous pure storage yeah. presentations. Yeah. Just go to techfieldday.com <laughs> and you'll see those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just In Google it. How's yeah. that? Just Google it. Yeah.